Welcome to another episode of Shortcast Over Coffee. My guest today is Dimitris Nikolao. Dimi is the co-founder of Wondercraft.ai, which uses speech-to-text technology to make podcasting easier. With Wondercraft, anyone can easily turn their content, be it newsletters, blogs, interviews, or recordings, into professional quality podcasts in minutes. In this episode, I talked to Dimi about his college life, Y Combinator, and his startup, Wondercraft. Let's get on with the episode. Hi, Dimi. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Bala. Thank you very much for having me today. Yeah. It's uh, 2023, and uh, I just got started with my podcast. And um, some say that um, it's it's a very hard hard job and pod- that the heydays of podcasting is long gone. You know, the heydays of podcasting was probably like 2012, 2013, and now it's all Reels and TikTok and all of that. And here you are with your co-founder, Yusuf, coming with an AI tool for podcasting. Um, was this always the idea that you wanted to start a company uh, or were there other options before you moved into AI for podcasting? Uh, first of all, congrats to you. I know it's a recent venture and I'm very happy to uh, see more podcasts popping up, especially you know these type where you uh, get to meet people through this process. And I think that's like very fun. So I hope this journey uh, takes you to where you want it to take you. But I, I heard a, to a few episodes and uh, content is excellent. So keep going with that. Um, in terms of like what we've, uh, what we started doing and where this has ended up, uh, the answer is no, we didn't uh, start with the uh, concept. Uh, when we started our entrepreneurial journey, it wasn't um, this particular platform that we've now developed. We actually started a little bit more than uh, a year ago. I'm working on a separate tool, which was, I'm not going to go too much into it, but uh, in short, it was a platform that enabled anyone to invest in the career of young athletes. Um, it was really fun. Uh, both of us, both of the co-founders, we come from a sports background. We were competitive athletes growing up. It was something close to our heart uh, for different reasons. Um, it's not particularly important for this podcast. Maybe we can have a separate one for that. We decided at some point to move on to a different concept. And that was uh, about six months ago. That's uh, maybe yeah, five months ago, uh, beginning of April, basically of 2023. Um, and it's now, and we're recording in end of August. Uh, we decided that we wanted to move on. And obviously, I'm sure that you're well aware of all of the AI advancements that have happened uh, in the end of 2022 and beginning of 2023. One uh, advancement that has not been uh, very much focused on, has not as many people have been focusing on it, is the text-to-speech advancement. Um, so apart from the all of the big LLMs and uh, text-to-image generation, text-to-speech is a frontier that has been developing significantly. And um, basically the way that things clicked is uh, myself and my co-founder, we have a very close friend who is uh, working on, has been working on text-to-speech for a while. So we were able to see from the inside how things are going and how these models were developing so fast and we're becoming of high quality uh, to the extent that we now realize that this was the first time that the audio generated from text to speech is actually quite engaging and it doesn't sound, you know, the TikTok robotic version or the Amazon Alexa. Um, and uh, we decided that we recognize that it's the first time that podcasts can actually be generated through this way. Um, and as big fans of podcasts and as past creators of podcasts ourselves, having seen the com- how cumbersome the creation of a podcast is, uh, we decided that we are going to release a tool that is uh, enables anyone to create a podcast very simply. Um, and uh, we just wanted to see if there's going to be interest in that. And there was a ton of interest uh, from the very beginning. So we never really looked back ever since that. Uh, the company has now developed to being something a little bit more than just that. Uh, that's one platform, uh, the podcast builder that we have, but we're doing more more uh, in relation to making content more accessible using uh, text-to-speech. Uh, dubbing is one solution that many of our uh, clients, customers are interested in, and we're doing a few other things. So um, we've we've you know evolved from being that particular uh, tool to doing a few other things. But uh, to go back and summarize your original question, no, it wasn't how we started, but 
Uh, I'm very happy that we did reach this point eventually because I just love working in uh, the podcasting space, uh, enabling people to create podcasts. Uh, it's been a very fun and um, I'm very excited about where the future goes. Nice. So um, you mentioned how you jumped into the AI space uh, probably at the start of 2022. Did you and Yusuf have uh, the background necessary or were you just yeah. excited about the space? Uh, do you have a computer science background? Would love to know more about that. Uh, yeah. So to be clear, we didn't jump into the AI space in 2022. Uh, we just... Um, we were very close to it because we both come from a computer science background and specifically a machine learning background. Um, both Yusuf and myself graduated with engineering degrees back in 2018, uh, focused on machine learning stuff. Um, myself, I even though my, my undergrad was in economics, I focused on machine learning from back then. Uh, and then I did my postgrad in computer science, then Yusuf graduated in electrical engineering. Um, at Palantir, where we went after uh, after graduation, we worked there for four years, and a lot of that time was spent on developing machine learning applications for customers of Palantir. So we were always very close to uh, the developments and uh, understanding. I think it's um, uh, the the basic technology. Um, it, it it's all it's all it, it all boils down to understanding like how neural networks work. Most of the advancements these days happen with the use of neural networks, uh, and then keeping up with the state of the art models becomes easier when you know how uh, the basics work. And given that we had those fundamentals, things were a little bit easier for us to to, to keep up. Even though like that, we didn't primarily work in machine learning for a few years, um, and then. Yeah, as I said, um, when we were deciding on uh, moving to something, a different concept from our first entrepreneurial journey, uh, we decided to be involved in uh, a little bit more deeply involved in the AI space, given that there's such a boom. Actually, it's not particularly true. It's not that um, the boom was the uh, incentive for us to to go down that path, but it was the the fact that uh, the boom was happening for a particular reason, that reason being that these models are now unlocking many use cases. And then this use case that we decided to go down the, this path of uh, is something that had never been done before because it was not able to be done before, given that text-to-speech models were never this good to generate engaging audio. So this is uh, this is the, um, the background for both Yusuf and myself in relation to AI. And both of you went to Imperial College, London? Uh, yes, yes. So we were uh, we were both at Imperial. Um, well, my my postgrad, my um, master's degree was at Imperial College. Yusuf's full education journey was at Imperial. Um, I had a little bit of a more uh, adventurous um, childhood and uh, first degree. The reason why I'm calling it adventurous is because I was a competitive athlete growing up. I played basketball. Uh, and a lot of my decisions were incentivized uh, by from that vector rather than focusing on specifically only educational or something else. Uh, and in fact, um, when I when I came to the UK, when I did my undergrad, uh, it, the reason why I wanted to uh, do my um, to do my undergrad at that particular university was because I was offered to play professional basketball for uh, the the team happened to be affiliated with that university that I chose to be, which is University of Surrey. Um, so I got the chance to both study and uh, at a at a good university in the UK and compete at a very high level, which was what my mindset was at at that stage. It's very hard for a um, kid that's you know, when you grow up uh, a competitive athlete, it's very, very hard to move uh, away from it. Um, I had clear indicators that I was, you know, never going to be anything special uh, in relation to that space. But, you know, as a kid, you develop dreams with whatever matters to you the most at that time. And basketball was it, uh, which was why my many of my decisions were influenced by that. But um to to conclude in this, yes, I I went to Imperial, but I uh, happened to go through a different uh, angle in getting there. Yeah, I don't I don't remember knowing anyone who who was a sports person first and then started a company in an entirely different domain. Uh, you know of these uh, really popular sports people who start a, a sports company or a sports management company, sports tech company. So this is quite interesting. Um, I just want to 
I just want to know how uh, Imperial College is. Uh, I know it's one of the top most ranked colleges in in the world, uh, yeah. but does it have a very uh, incubator like or startup like environment? Is it is does it promote that? And did Imperial College help your startup journey in any way? Um. So Imperial is incredible uh, from one perspective. Uh, what is incredible about it is the quality of uh, people, quality of students that attend that university is incredibly high. Uh, at the moment, effectively, we are two co-founders slash three co-founders right now. Our founding engineer is um, uh, that joined us from the very beginning of Wondercraft is also from Imperial. He was a good friend of mine during that time. And many of my friends are still from, uh, are, many of my friends to this day are from Imperial. And that just highlights that um, Imperial is like a very high quality. Uh, I think it's given its proximity to London being the, probably the biggest startup hub in, um, um, sorry, the in, in Europe. Uh, I could, you know, approximate it to being uh, the equivalent of Stanford in relation to Silicon Valley. Many companies want to, hire from Imperial. And in fact, Palantir uh, hires very aggressively from Imperial, which is the reason why both Yusuf and myself ended up um, at uh, Palantir. But in relation to your question, if it's an incubator, I would actually, uh, from the global perspective of assessing how good in terms of entrepreneurship it is, I wouldn't say that it's anything extraordinary, especially in comparison to U.S. universities that I know all have like startup clubs and um, assess, uh, assist students a little bit more. Um, maybe it's because it's not as ingrained into U.K. culture. Startups are not as ingrained as in the U.S. culture. And like I know, for example, University of Michigan and um, Stanford, of course, MIT, Caltech, they have very big uh, startup accelerators themselves. I don't, uh, it's not as uh, prominent in Imperial, but again, I don't, uh, I'm comparing this to the global state of the, you know, the global state rather than the UK state. If we were to compare it with the UK state, I think it is in fact the, um, it does assist the most in that, but um, yeah, in comparison to the US counterparts, it's a little bit behind. So right after Imperial, you, you start working for Palantir. Um, I am someone who has invested heavily in Palantir. How was that experience like? How did you enjoy your time at Palantir? Yeah, uh, it's funny. Most people I meet uh, know Palantir either about like secretive stuff and are fear a little bit about Palantir or they know PLTR, the ticker of Palantir because they've invested in the stock. Um, Palantir was incredible. I would say the biggest, uh, the biggest reason why it was incredible is the similar reason to Imperial, uh, the quality of the people. Um, it's just, uh, most of the people end up going and doing their own thing. It's kind of a, a feature and incubator a bug. in itself. Yeah, is it? exactly. Exactly. It's kind of a feature and a bug in the hiring process of Palantir because it tends to hire entrepreneurial minds. Um, but then three years down the line, they all leave to go and start their own thing. So, uh, retention is hard for our people like that. Um, apart from that, though, I do think I genuinely believe and I try to convince as many young friends of mine to go and start their journey uh, at Palantir. And the reason is that um, it basically is a confined and well uh, constrained, sorry, not constrained, a confined and the opposite of constrained, unconstrained environment where you can test your first startup uh, entrepreneurial ideas because you basically even as a young kid as like a couple one year two years out of college you can be given the keys to go and um i uh, try and get a new client for the company uh and um you know the the accountability and responsibility that was given to me and many of my colleagues so fast uh, i don't think that is possible to be given anywhere else um, I think that's potentially one of the reasons is because Palantir is growing that fast. So someone needs to take that responsibility and kids end up taking that responsibility. It is sometimes funny, you know, you have 25 year olds trying to convince like stakeholders, um, like, you know, a little bit more experienced and senior stakeholders or even government officials. Um, 
it doesn't always play best that we have been blamed to be like young, arrogant kids, you know? Um, but uh, it is, um, to, to go back to your point, it's uh, it's an incredible place, incredible people there, and the the accountability and responsibility that is given to you is is very good. Um, if I had to say what's uh, a downside to all this is that you, given the responsibility and the accountability, there's sometimes a lack of control and maybe some chaos in uh, not chaos, but like not the uh, structured path in career development. Uh, so if you're someone that's expecting from your seniors to tell you exactly what you need to do in order to progress and get to that level, that's not, uh, that's not what you're going to find a pound here. And you should probably be looking for maybe, uh, maybe some, a different corporate structure, but, um, again, it's a feature and a bug in relation to that, right? Like you're given the responsibility, but you're not going to have the cohesive structure that will allow you to progress. So, um, but yeah, Palantir, incredible place. Uh, highly encourage anyone that is, uh, especially in the first stages of their career, to um, try and enter that. And I'd be happy to help um, with um, answering any questions that some people may have in the interview phase. Yeah, I think I think what you mentioned is pretty true with a lot of startups. I know Palantir, I don't know if you can call it a startup. Obviously not because it's public now. Uh, but uh, initial phases, I'm pretty sure the whole documenting of uh, you know how to do a promotion and all of that will will take time so i'm pretty sure they'll figure their fi figure their way out um then you move to y combinator soon after palantir uh, the application process for y combinator is well documented we all know that it's one of the toughest places to get into but what was your personal journey like how did how did you want to uh, move into something like a Y Combinator? Um, of course, I was also on the same side as many people are that are, uh, you know, getting into Y Combinator is kind of a dream. Um, I think the biggest reason why it was a dream for me is because I was actually quite happy at Palantir. Um, and so I needed a strong force to allow me to pursue my dream and entrepreneur and like my entrepreneurial dream. And I'm very thankful that I got the opportunity to be accepted into Y Combinator and pursue my entrepreneurial dream, sorry, dream, which has been uh, incredible for a year now. In terms of like how I perceived the um, application process, honestly, at some point in 2022, I decided that uh, there was this concept that was uh, both for myself and my co-founder, Yusuf, it was... It was burning inside us, and uh, we just had to try and uh, uh, try and develop it. Um, that was uh, the previous concept that uh, I mentioned, and uh, honestly, it was just on a whim. Uh, we decided to apply. The application process itself was not on a whim. It did take us a few, a couple, or maybe a three more days in uh, developing the uh, application, but. Um, at the end of the day, we applied with just a concept in mind, nothing, you know, no proper like website or anything. Uh, and that's just to, to, to say like, um, at the end of the day, Y Combinator will try to evaluate other things rather than the ready product solution. Um, I know many users, many people are afraid of applying to, to Y Combinator because they don't have like that final product yet. Uh, we genuinely did not even have a landing page. Um, it was just like whatever text we had in that application process. And we applied at the very last day of the deadline. And to our very surprise, the very last day of them accepting companies or asking for interviews, we got an email requesting an interview. Um, genuinely, I had completely forgotten about Y Combinator at that point. I wasn't like tracking dates or anything. Um, I remember a friend of mine texting me on that day saying, did you hear back? Uh, today is the last day because they had applied as well. I was like, I wasn't even sure what they were referring to, to be honest. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we received an email from uh, Dalston that was interested in uh, interviewing us. And uh, it was, you know, a um, couple of frantic days, but at the end of it, we actually had a couple of interviews, uh, one with Dalston and one with Harj. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, we got accepted. And um, that was that was a really, really happy moment for us because it just uh, enabled us to have a strong force in uh, in moving to the next step of our life. And um, again, very thankful for the experience that Y Combinator has given us. Did you apply to other programs as well, like plug and play or just Y Combinator? No, no, it was just Y Combinator that we applied to. Um, we, again, we were actually like not dying to leave from Palantir. Um, we were okay, but again, like the entrepreneurial journey, the dream was what we wanted to proceed with. Um, so we weren't like actively pursuing something different, uh, but we got the opportunity due to, uh, if if we were to get an opportunity, we wanted to do it right. And we felt Y Combinator was that right solution. So we only applied to that one. Yeah, I think it's quite inspiring how you say that you did not have a website, you did not have a product, but even then you you could convince Y Combinator to to take you in. Um, yeah. But but having gone into Y Combinator, did they give you a feedback as to why you were selected over the other applicants? Um, or what do you think worked for you? So I think it was I think it was primarily uh, they index a lot on. The background of the founders, they say that the biggest indicator to future success is uh, past success. And um, I think that without uh, hoping that this doesn't sound arrogant, but the, um, you know, Imperial and Palantir themselves were actually like, I believe um, they didn't explicitly state so, but I believe they were uh, uh De decent signals of past success but realistically at the end of the day i think we can uh given that both myself and yusuf were engineers um they tend to focus a lot on the 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 founding team being able to build the solution the solution that they're pitching themselves rather than having to rely on either a contractor or someone else uh so the fact that we were both engineers um we had a pretty compelling uh pitch and background, both of us being competitive athletes and wanting to do something in relation to sports. Uh, and then, of course, again, as I mentioned, uh, Imperial and Palantir probably played some role as well. I think those were the factors that led to us being accepted. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned to me that even before Y Combinator, you were also involved in a few startups, right? Uh, in the sports arena? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, not necessarily. Um, I wasn't involved in other startups. I only through like maybe university, you know, some university competitions, nothing serious, never anything materialized, never made any money from anything. Um, but uh, I did run like a sports analytics advisory thing when I was uh, uh, in my undergrad. Uh, didn't make any money from it. I was just doing it for the team that I was playing at. Um, and... Then apart from that, it was mostly like thinking about this first concept that we went into Y Combinator with Moonshot. That was the most prevalent uh, entrepreneurial concept that we went down on. Okay. Yeah. Everyone knows that Y Combinator gives you this incredible platform. It connects you with a lot of venture capitalists, also, also gives you capital. But before and after Y Combinator, what do you think it has been the biggest difference when you look at starting a company and why should one go through this process? How does it change them? Um, I think there's maybe like two or three uh, differentiators to Y Combinator in comparison to, uh, I will caveat this by saying that I don't have too much experience in other uh, accelerators so or other in. Uh, yeah, not uh, not accelerators. Let's say someone yeah. wants to do a startup without an accelerator, mm -hmm. without going through yeah. like an accelerator program. So yeah, uh, I will um, I will highlight these points in uh, descending order of value. The first one by far has been the um, leverage that we received in raising additional seed funding. Um, that was something that helped us significantly. You know, the, kind of the the tables turn instead of the founders having to do cold outreach or try to get in contact with uh, investors, it kind of uh, reverses and people try to actively speak to you. Uh, there's also this prevalent, um, I'm not sure uh, how many um, of, uh, of your listeners will be aware of this, but at the end, uh, basically the, the um, Y Combinator 
ends in this uh, big event called Demo Day, where all of the companies of the batch get to have a 60 second, that's it, 60 second pitch of their company. And then there's um, close to 100,000 um, investors that uh, join that, uh, where it's a virtual room now, um, to try and find out more about these companies. And then after that, it's just like kind of uh, chaos and and investors that want to speak to you. Uh, so, but even before the demo day, there's companies that will, there's um, funds that will want to speak to you. So that was by far the biggest um, advantage that we received, the biggest benefit that Y Combinator gave us. Following that, uh, there's a couple of things. The second thing, what I would highlight is there's this uh, just huge database of resources called Bookface. It's basically the internal um, network, both like social network in the sense that all of the profiles of people are there, but also resource network. Um, you know, we're going to find information such as like um, how to fundraise or uh, how to price your uh, how to price your product in the beginning. Everything I genuinely mean there's something about everything. Um, so that that bank of resources is extremely valuable, uh, especially for a young startup that uh, some questions just reappear and then they figured out how to answer these questions. And then finally, the uh, other advantage is the fact that you get to join this journey with other companies that are with you basically exactly at the same stage. And um, most of the time, you're not competitors, right? It's just uh, everyone doing their own field. So it's just like kind of... Um, they often say that entrepreneurs are uh, kind of lonely and it's a solo thing. It's uh, it's, a, it's hard to go through that process, especially in the beginning. But when you go through that process with uh, bigger teams, sorry, with a bigger set of teams, uh, then it becomes a little bit better, both in terms of like the, um, in terms of the fun, like having fun on your day-to-day -day seeing like other people around you doing the same thing. It's also uh, very valuable for you as a founder to know that other people are going through the same thing. Um, it's very, very challenging to be at the very early stages of a startup. So having other people that are also facing the same thing, it's kind of like therapy, uh, having weekly meetings with everyone. Um, and even further, like you make lifelong friends. Uh, we now have an office in London. We share an office with another company that was in our batch that we became friends with. So, you know, like there's other, there's also long-term advantages to this third benefit. So I would, I would highlight those three benefits as the biggest benefits that we received from Wine Combinator. Okay. Now coming back to Wondercraft, uh, talk to me about why someone's wanting to start a podcast in 2023 should leverage Wondercraft. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're probably uh, well equipped to answer that question yourself, given that you have gone through this process recently. But basically, uh, starting a podcast is a cumbersome and time consuming process. Uh, let's describe what that looks like. You got to first think about software that you're going to use for both recording and editing and podcast hosting. That's actually not easy to understand all that landscape. After that, you got to figure out what microphone to buy. Um, and then following that, you got to also learn how to edit so that you can make the podcast quite engaging and appealing. And editing itself is a cumbersome and tedious process. Um, what we and many people uh, end up not uh, creating a podcast because it's uh, uh, you need to go through all of these hoops and many more that I didn't go into. Uh, in order to to get going and have something successful. Uh, finally, one more problem with podcasts is that the reason why most of them are successful, uh, and I think you're doing very well on that space, is consistency, right? Like releasing more than a couple of episodes or at least a couple of episodes per week so that you can build habits for your listeners. Um, and given how cumbersome it is to uh, record and edit uh, and or even the logistics of getting your uh, your audience there, it's quite complicated to make sure that you have that consistency. So effectively what Wondercraft is, is a, um, I think probably the first ever podcast builder. It enables someone to go from an idea to a podcast episode very simply and quite fast. Um, the reason why we wanted to do this is because there's uh, inherent benefits and uh, an increasing number of benefits in podcasting, such as 
Uh, you know, you can use podcasts to generate leads. Uh, it's basically content that people can listen to. And uh, as a business, for example, if you have a podcast and you talk about the space that you're in, people are going to uh, consider you an authority in that space potentially, or like consume your, your content in uh, socials, or even going to the simplest stuff. Uh, even There's benefits in SEO, right? Like having backlinks towards your website on Spotify is actually a very important thing. Um, so, or even try the transcript, uh, having the transcript on your, on your website to add those keywords. That's also important. Um, so there's many like inherent benefits in podcasting and podcasting as a space and the, how many people are listening to podcasts is increasing continuously. Uh, so the combination of like having a podcast, uh, how valuable having a podcast is together with like how difficult it was allowed us to think about, to develop this easy solution that, now someone can go and develop a podcast, develop their first episode in 10 minutes, um, and uh, then they can start start having all of these benefits that I mentioned. So most of our clients are seeing our, our businesses that are trying to, to capture these benefits and generate leads from having a podcast. Yeah, I think one of the examples that comes in my mind is Trader Joe's. Uh, Trader Joe's is this American grocery chain, and they have a podcast, and yeah. and that has really helped them, um, you know, connect with their customers on what products they have in the, in the shelves. Yeah. Yeah. So Trader Joe's, uh, yeah. So um, if you don't mind me elaborating on that, like Trader Joe's is an excellent example. Like they had no business going into podcasting, right? But they have not just one podcast, they have a podcast network of quite a few podcasts. And it's not necessary that in your podcast, you just talk about produce, you know, like you're not just going to talk about Trader Joe's. It's fun. Uh, yeah, it's fun. Exactly. Um, and people are going to listen to it. Sometimes there might be some organic placement of the company, but it's not just about that. It's more about like building that brand affinity. Um, and Trader Joe's is a good example, but there's many more. Um, like I know for a fact that iHeart, iHeart Media has like a component uh, that they call Ruby that they partner with uh, companies to help them create branded podcasts. And they've done some excellent podcasts for Under Armour and Coca-Cola and IBM. Uh, and these are like usually like 10 to 20 episode series that, um, you know, they, they don't just talk about the companies, but they build that brand affinity and the SEO value and all that stuff that I mentioned before. Uh, so yes, it's an excellent example, Trader Joe's. And uh, I think there's an increasing number of businesses that are considering um, podcasts because it's not just the audio, you can now generate video as well. And with Wondercraft, you can generate video. Um, which you can share on your socials. And that's just like, um, uh, and you mentioned at the beginning that like people are moving towards TikTok and Instagram and all of that, but like sharing clips of podcasts, that's just like fire. Many people really like that. So yeah, I think Joe Rogan did something similar. He has this yeah. JRE clips and then he clips. shares snippets of uh, the yeah. the main parts of his podcast and, and they go viral and people want to go check out his long form episodes. So. Exactly, exactly. I don't actually know if it's Joe Rogan because he has a Spotify contract. I don't know if he's allowed to post stuff outside of Spotify, but I think there's other people that clip for him. Okay, um, or maybe this was before he got the contract before. or whatever. But yeah, yeah there is there is a YouTube channel called JRE Clips or something. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it, yeah. So, so when it comes to podcasting, there are two kinds of podcasts, right? I mean, there are different kinds, but I'm just going to classify them into two. One of One of them is where it's like a monologue, you know, like the New York Times Daily or Crime Junkie. And the second one involves interactions, like the one I'm doing right now, wherein I bring guests in the podcast and I, I bring out their lives on the show. Is Wondercraft catering to the first than the second? Uh, what are your thoughts about, about Yeah, that? I think that's a great question. Um, I do think that podcast as a term is a little bit overloaded and it's hard to explain exactly like what you mean. I do think that there's potentially a little bit more of an association in uh, in terms of um, associating the term with the interview format podcasts, although that's actually strictly not true in the sense that most podcasts are not interview formats or conversational formats and the fastest growing um, podcasts are the ones that are just like narrational or just one person speaking. Um and to answer your question, I do think that Wondercraft is best catered for that first case, yes. Um, and the primary reason is that 
you know, in the conversational format podcasts, there's a little bit of magic hap that happens in the interaction. It's hard to mimic that by um, uh, just like questions and answers. Like if you if we were to do this, for example, over questions and answers over email. Um, so yes, most of our customers are developing podcasts that are like narration of a particular story or news daily news rundowns. Um, that said, there are successful cases from our customers that are running um, interview format podcasts. And the reason is that sometimes it's actually um, valuable to distill the pure information uh, and the written format enables you to do that rather than having to add a little bit more of fluff that I necessarily do when I speak. Um, so I'm not saying that it's better uh, in the sense that um, it becomes more engaging, but there are people that would prefer to, for example, uh, you know, uh, you know, Michael Phel Phelps being an example, someone would want to interview Michael Phelps. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why audio wouldn't work. Uh, potentially logistics is tough. Finding good quality microphones would be tough. Email. And then finally, like the conversation might be a little bit longer, whereas you can do the information distilling of like 10 questions over questions and answers. So um, although, yes, I will agree with you that the uh, first interview, the first um, format of podcast is actually what most of our customers are doing. There are successful cases for the second case, the second format. And I do think that there is a future there as well uh, and something that we're doing a little bit more research on on how to make sure that that content is also very engaging and it doesn't sound monotonous. Okay. Uh, I would love to know some of your customer success stories. Uh, you can name them. You can choose not to name them. But what has yeah. been your some of some of the cases that that you were like, wow, that that's pretty interesting. Uh, cool. Yeah, for sure. I'd be happy to speak about a few of them. So um, I'd say that by far the most customers that we have right now, uh, that's not to say that they're the biggest in terms of monetary value, but the most that we have are uh, newsletters that want to have an accompanying audio and create, a, I think there's at least 100 uh, at this point, 100 newsletters that use Wondercraft to... Um, to create an audio companion to their daily newsletter. So that's one use case that we're seeing a lot, but like a few others that I really liked. Uh, well, first of all, Coindesk is a customer. Coindesk is a big crypto publication for anyone that doesn't know. And they use Wondercraft um, often to create either like their daily podcast, you know, their daily news uh, can be using Wondercraft. Sometimes they intermix that. It's not always Wondercraft, sometimes it is. And what they do is uh, during the day, you know, a special report is going to come up, uh, you know, something, you know, Ethereum flipped Bitcoin as an example, and they want to have content out fast. They're going to use Wondercraft to put, uh, to put uh, some content out there. So um, that's pretty cool. We love having Coindesk as a client. And then um, it's more about like the other customers are more about like, I really like some use cases of businesses that are doing what we we're describing before which is just similar to Trader Joe's, right? Like they're going to talk about something that's um, approximates their their space. Uh, so there's this golf resort in uh, Illinois uh, that speaks actually a collection of golf resorts um, that they have a podcast that uh, it speaks about golf news. They have a daily news golf podcast and they found that their uh, clientele is growing in relation because of the podcast. Um we have another one that's a furniture company, I believe in Oklahoma. Uh, they have a big online presence. They're the, one of the biggest furniture companies in Oklahoma. And they uh, have a podcast that talks about designing a house and you know all that stuff that is um, uh, ad adjacent to uh, their, their uh, product that their target clientele would be interested in listening. And then as a result would... Uh, associate that company as a uh, as an um, industry expert, as an authority in that space. So those are like a few examples that we're, um, we're seeing out there in the market right now. Oh, excellent. Uh, talking about clientele, um, how, how difficult was the marketing part? You start a company, uh, how did you go about ma marketing? Uh, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> 
it's hard for every company in the beginning, right? It's uh, you got to figure out like what, who you want to, um, who's your target uh, clientele. Um, and there are, I'm not going to lie, like there are companies that are, you know, absolute killers from the very beginning, but for 95, 99% of the companies, you got to go through in the very beginning, go through the struggle and um, go through the grind of uh, sending multiple emails and um, finding some customers. From that point on, um, to be honest, for us, it was it was a fortunate time for us to be in the market. There's a lot of AI tailwind going on, and there were we have a maybe like inherently there is an inherent virality in our product. People are interested in sharing, especially in these AI hype days. People are interested in sharing this like podcast AI tool. So there was a lot of like uh, Twitter um, mentions of us and sharing our video. That's how we got like most of our maybe first 300, 400 users were um, paying users were in relation to that. Um, it also got featured that. in just uh, a week in startups uh, by Jason. Yeah. Calacanis. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think Jason was a little bit afraid of losing his uh, moderator job there. No, no, I'm joking, of course. Um, but um it's uh, yeah, it did, you know, it's because of leak like, these AI days, it it catches a little bit of uh virality in relation to that. So we had that in relation to us. And that's actually like a good potential suggestion for someone. Um, it does make sense to try and catch a wave. It's hard to create the wave yourself, but it's very in the beginning, it's hard to grow. And if you catch a wave, but you need to be ready to catch the wave, right? Like you can't just start, you need to be ready. And if you're ready to catch the wave and start when the wave is there, uh, or at least it's starting to grow, then it's going to be easier to market it. Um, that's how it was for us in the beginning. Of course, there was more like outreach for us. Uh, and then since then, it's been a lot of um, uh, word of mouth. Uh, we have a referral uh, we have a referral policy as well that uh, has been growing through that and an affiliate marketing that users are now generating content for us. Um, so we don't do too much in relation to outreach right now because there's a lot of inbound traffic that we need to manage and we're still a small team. But um, yeah, in, um, the, in the beginning, it was we were part of like AI hype. And then now it's mostly about like uh, word of mouth and referrals tracking back to uh my previous question about you know two different podcast podcasting uh genres yeah. i think i think the second type can still use wondercraft for other purposes like you know putting the intro music and editing yeah no that's uh that's very true uh intro music editing ads is something that we're playing with right now uh, making sure that we can develop a an interface that allows users to easily develop uh, some ads for brands. Um, so those are like things that we're playing with right now. And in fact, the uh, the biggest the biggest benefit to users that are developing and that are having interview in, like different styles of different formats of podcasts, or they prefer to do a recorded podcast instead. Uh, the biggest uh, offering that we have right now is we started offering dubbing. As I mentioned in the beginning, and dubbing is um, again given the recent AI tools, it's uh, the first time that we can get a very good translation, and the very first time that we can get an engaging audio in another language. So, um, you know, if you use Wondercraft, you know, as soon as we finish this episode, uh, if you're doing any editing as well, after that, um, an hour later, if you throw that in Wondercraft, an hour later, we can be speaking um, 28 other languages. Uh, even the video part is going to be aligned. So that's something that most other customers of ours in that space and the dubbing space are interested in. Um, sorry, in the most customers that already have a podcast are interested in. Uh, and uh, it's been really cool working because some of our customers there are some quite prominent podcasts. Um, cool working with uh, podca podcast OGs and uh, understanding more about their work all these years. Yeah, and and maybe maybe the other domain that something like a, a speech to text, sorry, text to speech can go into is something like a movie narration. You know, uh, yeah. a lot of a lot of movies do have parts where the the there is narration, and and you can just just you uh, use AI for that. No, that's true. Um, I'm not gonna lie; it's not an area that we focused on in the past. I think. 
uh, there's potentially in relation to movies, movies, you know, there's acting podcast is a little bit more of just conversation. There's less as emotion Voice modulation. As yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's easier to capture the emotion of podcasts, but in relation to movies, sometimes it's like very, very hard to capture that full emotion. Um, there's companies that are doing excellent research and um, a friendly company to us. Uh, Eleven Labs is leading the pact in relation to um, generally text to speech, uh, just the infrastructure layer. And then they're developing some applications in relation to that. Uh, so um, I have high confidence that um, potentially even Eleven Labs themselves will will crack movie dubbing in the future as well. Wow, that's that's an exciting time to be in. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, my listeners would love to know what stage you are in. Uh, if if there are potential investors, uh, yeah, what is your what does your path look like? Uh so we uh we're actually not raising uh right now. It's um we've fundraised like earlier on with um in our process after Y Combinator. And uh, at the moment, we're solid focused on improving and iterating both the podcast builder platform, but also other uh, platforms that we're working on in relation to text to speech. Um, but I would highly encourage you to follow the journey. There's a lot coming. If you're interested, uh, we are hiring as well in many different roles. So feel free to reach out at team at wondercraft.ai. Um, and um, try out if you're interested in like having a podcast, try out Wondercraft. Uh, I'm sure you're uh, most people are quite excited about the quality of the voices that they see. And um, I don't know if it's like worth doing as a hobby, you know, like it's probably worth doing uh, it, it's some work. So it's probably best if you're looking to monetize off of it. Um, but um, if you have like proper reason or if you have a business and you're looking to uh leverage more content to grow the audience or the the leads of the company then um reach out i'd be happy to help you out and getting going awesome a uh, couple more things before before we end the podcast uh yeah. one is how do you inspire young talents to join wondercraft uh, it, it just doesn't apply to wondercraft but for any startup right uh, yeah. You need really good talent because you're building a product. You need to have them to have some conviction about the product as well. Uh, how do you attract talent? Uh, that's a great question. I think that it's hard to convince someone when there is no interest from their side. It's easier when you uh, tap in a pool of people that are interested. So, for example, um, looking at other people that are building stuff in the in the Audio space is something that's um, somewhere where you can find common a common thread. Uh, that's some that's a way that we've hired in the past. Uh, for example, there was this kid that is now working for us, uh, is working in our team, and he's been incredible until now. Um, uh, he's fresh grad, and uh, he was developing some podcasts using text to speech. Um, and we have had a chat and, uh, then we convinced them to join our team. We're very fortunate about that, but, to answer your question, I think what's important to do is, um, be very transparent about like their, uh, responsibilities and accountability, make sure that they're, uh, aware of like what they're getting into. Uh, I think mo that's a positive for most of the people, for the ones that is not, you probably don't want them to be in your startup anyway. Um, and, uh, for the ones that are like the fact that they get this responsibility, I'm, uh, they're going to get excited by it. So that's, uh, one thing. And then apart from that, I think what's very important is for the founding team to have a very clear and transparent, uh, roadmap, um, so that the team can align behind that and, um, uh, you know, indicate that confidence on the fact that what's being built is going to be valuable. Uh, so those are like a couple of reasons, a couple of, uh, available things. And I would say as the, the very first, the very first thing that I said in the beginning, try to find people that are actually interested in the space, not just find an engineer, find an engineer that's interested in audio. Uh, that's probably going to be even more valuable. Okay. Awesome. Um, 
So we are in 2023. Uh, CEOs are kind of like celebrities these days. So people would love to know what the day in the life of a CEO is like. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your uh, hobbies? Yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned that I'm, I used to be a competitive athlete that uh, the bug never went away. Although basketball is hard to, to participate in and London is actually not that big and um, due to like obviously very intensive hours, I can't find the time for basketball, but I have switched to other endurance sports. I used to do like more cycling and uh, swimming. Uh, so triathlon now I'm focused solely on running. So my day does start always with um, some running workout together with uh, we have a team. So most of the time is together with some other friends as well. Um, that's early morning usually. And then, uh, we recently have an office, um, here in London and, uh, probably at the office, usually, uh, you know, by eight thirty nine, uh, both myself and my co-founder like to be there early. Um, and sometimes the rest of the team is also there. We don't like, we're not fully always there. Uh, and then realistically, um, the day is spent, uh, working, whether it's like figuring out a new um a, a new direction like a new feature that we need to go down because it's been requested a lot or it's on customer calls customer support a lot of customer support right now for us we're still a small team sorry a lot of customer support from my side um and um usually like maybe half the day is on calls uh the rest the rest of the day is uh doing some other things and then it's usually like um, if there is a social event at the end of the day, maybe like a couple of times or one time a week, there will be a social event at the end of the day. So I would leave a little bit earlier. Otherwise, uh, it's usually about uh, stay at the office uh, with uh, the rest of the team, leave by like maybe uh, 8 to 8.30 p.m. And um, then back home for a little bit of chilling and maybe a little bit, some catch up of emails and stuff, but usually not too much uh before the day ends sounds like a very busy schedule but i am so grateful to you um that you you spend some time with uh with this podcast uh so thank you so much dimi i wish you and wondercraft ai and yusuf all the best uh and for someone who wants to start a podcast check out wondercraft.ai uh it's a great product i did test a, a few things myself so it's a great product and i wish you all the all the very best Thank you very much, Bala. I really appreciate the invite and uh, it was my pleasure and being on. It's always fun to speak to um, people that are genuinely interested in what you guys, what you're, what you're building. So again, I appreciate the excitement and enthusiasm in Wondercraft and I hope we cross paths as well again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bala.